It's because you you may not say it with your mouth. Mouth, I'm discipled by this, or I'm discipled by this person. Doesn't mean you're not being discipled, because whatever bombards you and whatever you listen to, whatever you give ear to, that is what will disciple you, good or bad. You know, many people they you know they're discipled by Ford, so they're Ford people. They're just that's just what they live by. Yeah, mm, that's right. We don't want to be discipled by that mess. <laughs> Amen. I grew up being discipled as a Chevy person. Okay, so we always, you know, put down Fords. Always, I don't drive a Chevy. I don't own a Chevy because that no longer disciples me. I do, I'm discipled by: Can I afford it? Can my budget fit it? Is it a good vehicle? Praise God. That's what I'm discipled by now. So it's like I don't, I don't really have a, a brand or whatever. But that just goes to show you that you can be discipled by things. But as much as you can be discipled by the wrong thing, you should, when you learn that it's wrong, say, oh, wait a minute. Now you submit yourself to accurate discipleship, biblical discipleship, to be restoratively discipled, we could say. That's one of the terms that we, that we uh, should probably dive into at some point. Maybe this year. We got the whole year to talk about discipleship, so we'll probably cover it at one point. But... When you're, I, I firmly believe with my pastor that for the first 13 years of a child's life, you have that opportunity to put the word into them, to put doctrine into them, to put what they need in them to sustain them for the rest of their life so they may keep growing and, and going in the things of God. But after that roughly 13 years, especially because many Americans say, well, it's 18 years. Well, 13 by the word of God, so that's what we're going to go by. But even after that, there is a restorative discipleship, which means that you've got to restore what should have been put in or should have taken out. So with that heart set, that mindset, we've got to understand there are certain things that we, even as adults, may have to root out of our heart and our life to say, all right, Lord, I need to re- restoration in this area of my life. I need to be restoratively discipled to get this out or to put this in. And, but that's still a fruit but there may be other fruit that we got to purge out because it's not of God or not appropriate for our lives or appropriate as Christians, however the case may be, because we're all different, so we all have different areas of our life we need to work on. So the purpose of this lesson is to explore biblical signs and evidences of discipleship. Remember, it is possible to faithfully attend a local church and never be a real disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember, it is possible to faithfully attend, not just a once a month or even faithfully attend the local church and never be a real disciple of Jesus Christ. I've had plenty of people that came here for a while until either I preached them out or whatever, however the case may be, but they faithfully attended here for a while and were never a disciple of mine or a disciple of this church. And that's why they no longer go here. Because at some point, there's going to be a crossroads where they're either going to choose their flesh or they're going to choose the Word. And you can, that will show you the fruit of discipleship. Which one are they going to honor more? The flesh or the Word? And those that go with the flesh, that shows who's been speaking into their life, which is their self. Because they make their self their God and they make themselves the disciple maker and the disciple, which is biblically incorrect all the way around. Anyway... So number one is reputation. It has been observed that we can never lose our reputation. We can only change it. You always have a reputation, whether it's good or bad. (laughs) That's like, you know, especially me being a supervisor for my company, you know, me and the other supervisors, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, discuss, you know, different workers, things that's going on, things, you know, we need to help out with different situations. And then one of us may mention somebody's name and the whole group goes, oh. That's a reputation because they're known as the problem child. They're known as the one that always has something going on, always has an issue. They, you know, we're always having to dig them out of trouble or to help them or to cover up, not cover up, but to cover their area because there's something going on all the time that we're having to help them with. That is not a reputation you want. (laughs) Amen. You want a reputation that says they're a hard worker, they're a good worker. Because there's other people when we say, yeah, so-and-so's needing a day off. Well, it's about time. They're such a hard worker. They never take off. They do this. They do that. They're so faithful and loyal and always helping out, helping the team. They're a true team member. They're a true 
you know, participant in being a part of our team. And it's like you've been over backwards for them. Amen. But you can see both of those is a reputation. So the bad one, the one that's in the trouble the most, they can't, they're not going to lose a reputation. They're just going to have to change the one they currently have. And that takes good fruit and it takes a consistency of good fruit. Amen. Amen. Because truth be told, we will always have a reputation of some sort. When a Christian has truly submitted to the discipleship process, it would define his or her life and cause others to take note. When a Christian has truly submitted to the discipleship process, when you truly submit, because people can say, oh, I'm, I'm a disciple of so-and-so, I'm a disciple of so-and-so, and they look and talk and do nothing like that person. Much like, <laughs> here comes the spike, when most Christians say, oh, I'm a child of God, well, act like one. Quit acting like your father the devil. Amen. Because that shows you've been more discipled by the devil than you are God. Amen. By the way you live your lifestyle, by the fruit that's in your life. So when a Christian is truly submitted to discipleship process, it would define his or her life and cause others to take note. Because others will say, you know what? I can tell they're a Christian because there's something different about them. They walk with God. They talk with God. They got this joy. They got this love. They got this peace. They got this long suffering. Man, that sounds like it ought to be in the Bible. It's because it is. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Others should take note. They may even be pagan and not know what they're talking about, not knowing that they're quoting the Word, but there's something about us as Christians, especially when we're discipled accurately and a true disciple of Jesus Christ, that something should be different in our life to show that, that we have a discipleship in our life. Amen. Now, there are reputations of others who are discipled by Jim Beam, by Jack Daniels, by Jägermeister, by, by illicit sex, by all these other things. And that's not a discipleship that we want to participate in because it brings death. But a discipleship of Jesus Christ, a discipleship that aligns you with the Word of God brings life and life more abundantly. Amen. 2 Kings 3.11 but Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of and one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Shaphat, yep, who which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now notice when they first bring Elisha up, they call out. He's the son of this. He's the son of his father. But they say he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now, if they know that he served Elijah and they know that he's a prophet as well, that's not what they're giving his reputation as. They're giving his reputation as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. That was his reputation. He served the man of God. He served the man of God. Anywhere Elijah went, he was there. Once they got hooked up, they were together. You'd hardly ever see Elijah without Elisha. He was the one that poured water on his hands. He took care of him. He was his servant. He was the one that blessed him. It was kind of his armor bearer, we could say, kind of our circle's vernacular or vocabulary. Though the teacher-disciple relationship is not overtly discussed in the Old Testament patterns, or patterns of such submission and learnership are evident throughout. Here, the new prophet on the scene, Elisha, yet his reputation was not one of a mighty prophet yet. It was that of the servant of, to Elijah. In essence, his reputation was based upon whom he had served and trained under and not what he could do. Now, I've witnessed this firsthand, you know, being around you know, Dr. Barclay's camp and being at conferences and different meetings that he has, when I get around people and I tell them, you know, they say, oh, are you, are, is Dr. Barclay your pastor? I say, no, Pastor Chris McMichael is my pastor. And so when I say that, as I've stated before, you can almost see the difference in people's faces and their expression of, oh, oh, okay, because they know the reputation of my pastor, how he's a, he's a Bible guy, he's a straight shooter, he lives, you know, lives in the Word, preaches the Word, you know, doesn't compromise. And so when they hear that, I can tell the relationship they have with my pastor just by the expression on their face. <laughs> They're either like, 
Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Like they get excited because, you know, I'm, I'm one of my pastor's, you know, people that he's sent out to pastor now to be a pastor. Or I've seen people where they're like, oh, okay, well, you have a good day. And they walk off and leave because they know my pastor. They know if, 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 this, if Pastor Chris feels, you know, we'll say confident enough to send this guy out to be a pastor himself, then obviously he's trained him, he's discipled him, so he's going to be pretty close to what Pastor Chris is. Now, I say, praise God, because I know some of those pastors that have kind of had that face about them, that scowl or that change of attitude real quick and they walk away. I know their reputations. I already know their reputation. So I'm expecting, and, and nine times out of ten, they prove me right. <laughs> Amen. But it's because I walk with my pastor because I serve with him and it kind of been in that same scenario with Elisha, with Elisha to Elijah, that I can I kind of understand this. I kind of get the concept, concept of that. Amen. But it's his reputation was based on whom, whom he had served and trained under and not what he could do. That's important who you hook up with, who you submit to, who you obey, who you allow to disciple you. Because not everybody that will make disciples is going to be accurate and holy. There are some that make disciples, I know in the, even in this region, that as they do so, they may not have a discipleship program, but because they're around them, they're putting things into them that are more worldly and carnal and less Holy Spirit, less Word of, word of God. But they're still church gatherings. They're still under the name of Jesus Christ, under the name of a church, but yet there's more carnality put into people as discipleship than the things of God. And that ought not be. The things of God should be coming from the house of God into the people of God to equip them, to mature them, as Ephesians 4 tells us that the fivefold ministers are to do. But the more as time progresses, the more that we hang around here on the earth, the less that begins to happen even in the houses of God. Amen. So this introduces us to the concept of, of spiritual pedigree. This introduces us to the concept of spiritual pedigree. That's why I, a lot of times, will tell you know, my, who my pastor is, Pastor Chris McMichael, and, my, and his pastor is Dr. Mark T. Barclay. When I say those things, I, I'm not saying it arrogantly and pridefully. I'm saying it so you know who I, who I come from, the kind of cloth I'm cut from. You know, even when we hosted the webinar here, we had, you know, some that hasn't got to be around Dr. Barclay yet. You know, my pastor's been here and preached a couple of times for us, but got to be around Dr. Barclay. So when we hosted the webinar, I had some people come up to me after the first session and said, I really like him. And I'm like, now you see where I come from. That I'm not just, you know, somebody that, you know, because, you know, I'm, in, I'm my age. I'm not going to give that away at the moment. But... I'm my age, and then my pastor is as older than I am. It's not just like, you know, two younger guys just trying to go and blow and, and do things on their own. We submit upward. So I, just, I submit to my pastor, but he submits to his pastor, which is in his 70s. He'll tell you straight out, Dr. Barclay is. So, but you have that lineage, that pedigree, and it flows down that we are all submitted, you know, in proper line, and that helps with a pedigree to understand this is where they come from. Because there's some people you get around, and you're like, where did you come from? Because you're kind of odd. And then you get around just the people they run around with or the people they submit to, and you're like, that explains the squirreliness. That explains a lot. <laughs> Amen. Because you get around some people, and then you say, where did you learn this undisciplined mind? And maybe you get around their parents, or you get around you know, their pastor, or you get around other leaders that they hang around, and you're like, yep. That explains everything right there. Amen. But that's a pedigree. We should have a spiritual pedigree that aligns with the Word of God. Just even as you hear certain times, certain scriptures, when Jesus is talked about, they don't just describe him as, as Mary's son or the son of God. Sometimes they say, Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David. That's his spiritual pedigree. So that shows even... Even back then in Jesus' time, and it should be still important for us as well, that it shows that we, we take seriously that pedigree of where we came from because 
really that's going to show who you're being discipled by. That's what it would ultimately mean, is when you're coming from that pedigree, you're coming from that lineage, that heritage, that is who you're being discipled by because that's who you submit to, especially our spiritual pedigrees. You will be known for who trained you. Amen. Amen. You know, even on a job site, you can tell the ones that are lazy, the ones that are, don't know their job quite as well. You can probably, well, for most jobs, you can look at somebody and say, so-and-so trained you, didn't they? Why, yeah, they did, because you act just like them. Because you don't, you don't have the work ethic like everybody else that was trained by somebody else. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is preaching a lot better than y'all are amen, and, and this is supposed to be a teaching session. But this goes even further with a pastor and with preachers. Who trained you? Who taught you that in the Word? Who taught you that? Well, Joel Osteen taught me that. You're wrong. He's not your pastor unless you go to Lakewood Church. See, this is the trouble that TBN, Daystar, all of those, they get people in trouble because they say, oh, that's my pastor. If he doesn't know your name, you don't have a pastor. I've got a dear friend of mine who's kind of off in left field, and I've used him quite a few examples a few times. But he has, he's really famous on a certain social media site, and everybody calls him pastor. Oh, that's my pastor. You, you, you live nowhere near the state that he lives in. You live in Timbuktu. He lives in Wazoo. You're nowhere near each other. How can that be your pastor? Because you watch his videos. Because you listen to him give these things. You don't listen to him preach. All you can do is listen to him give a few minutes of opinion. And cast a dream and give the interpretation. That's all you do. That's not your pastor. A pastor will actually give you the word, disciple you, and help you, mature you, and equip you for the things of God. There's Bible for that, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Amen. <laughs> but who can you say is trained and discipled you? Is their influence upon you evident? If somebody's influence, if somebody really has an influence in your life, you will take on their characteristics. Doesn't mean you say, all right, well, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start driving a Ford like this person does. I'm going to start driving this like this person does. Or I'm going to start, you know, whatever. I'm going to start wearing this certain brand of shirt because this person does. You shouldn't determine in your heart to do that. Just because you submit and are being discipled by somebody, that will automatically come into your flavor. And it doesn't mean you dress like them and be a little mini-me. It means that you just submit and that is going to wash over you. And the things that are important should be washing over you, and you begin to take on that flavor. Because more than anything, the Word of God is what should be washing over us and changing us. Now, if you're called to somebody to be, to be under their spiritual leadership, the Word should be washing over you. Now, granted, with that, some of the personality will come. There's like certain things that my pastor... Because he gives me the word because I receive from him. There are certain things of his personality that washes over me and just comes out sometimes. I don't even, I don't even realize it. So I don't even mean to. But I'm proud of that, though, because it shows that my heart is still submitted to him and still attached to him, that I, that I receive from him and take on that because that's who God has ordained to be in my life. Amen. So if somebody's influence isn't upon you, you should wonder, is your heart really attached to him? Are you really submitted? So Kenneth Copeland, after interacting briefly with a friend of mine, of course, this is my pastor's curriculum here. It says, a friend of mine said, I can tell you're one of Doc Barclay's boys. That should be evident. Amen. It should, or it would, have been an honor to be able to, to say that you served a Billy Graham or a Lester Summerall for 35 years. No doubt their hand would have left an imprint on your life. In the martial arts, it is very honorable to meet people who train directly under Bruce Lee, uh, Euro Kino, or any of the Gracies. So, of course, again, this is my pastor's testimony. But from 1996 to 2007, I faithfully attended church serving five different pastors. After 11 years of uh, consistent promotion, I was finally promoted into full-time ministry. Besides those five pastors, 
God has since added me to Dr. Barclay as my pastor and the late Pastor Stephen Okwoko as a father and mentor. I currently have several other older fathers and a few mothers in the faith as well. I'm constantly trying to honor them and serve them. They are, they are my mentors. I hope to always have some spiritual role model in my life. Amen. And this is why I consider it important to be around my pastor as much as I can, but also to be around Dr. Barclay, which is like a spiritual father to myself, but he's also my grand pastor, so there's kind of a double fold there. But to have that kind of mentor, to be able to have those you know, intimate moments for him to... I mean, he may be speaking to a group, but he's taken that small group setting to do like Jesus, to, to expound upon things, to be able to give insight, to be able to give wisdom that maybe he you know, doesn't have time for from the pulpit that he's ministering to the multitude. So I find those very precious and, and, and priceless to my life, to be around my pastor in that setting, to be around Dr. Barkley in those settings, to be around Dr. Jacobs in those settings. So, so those spiritual mentors to my life have helped shape and mold me in different ways. And so I encourage all disciples to do so. Amen. So what my mentors have taught me, all of my fathers and mentors speak or did speak of their lineage of faith. Amen. None of them were fatherless. I question any pastor who doesn't have a pastor. <laughs> you say, well, Dr. Barclay doesn't have a pastor. Well, when you reach that you have nobody older than you that to submit to because even Dr. Barclay has admitted he's still trying to find somebody and he hasn't found anybody yet because he's like the general. Because when you get so far up, in the, in, even in the natural military, it's like really nobody outranks you much. And so you're looking for who, who can you run with? Because he has friends that, you know, ministry friends that he's been partners with for a long time that he talks to or talk, you know, discusses different things. But as far as like a spiritual father, he's still looking for who could that be? And when you reach that kind of maturity in the things of God, when you've served God as long as he has, it may be hard to find somebody like that. But until then, anybody that does not have a pastor or somebody that's to help overlook their life and to help speak into their life, then I wonder, what, why are you a lone ranger? Why are you a lone ranger? Why are you so afraid to, to submit to somebody else? Because we, now we may call it that. We may call them Lone Rangers, but even Lone Ranger had Tonto. <laughs> Amen. It might not have been his, his buddy, that he, or he may not have been his spiritual father or a father they looked up to, but it was at least somebody he ran with that helped him get his rear end out of trouble sometimes. Even his horse got him out of trouble sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> so it makes you question, who, who are the fatherless that are declaring that they serve the Lord? but yet they don't have anybody they submit to. Their testimony and success were, were tied to the training and discipleship of their pastors and mentors. I have always desired to have the same testimony. There's been successes and things in my life, I know because it's tied to my pastor, tied to Dr. Barclay, tied to Dr. Jacobs, because of those mentors and fathers you know, speaking into my life and helping me. Amen. Pastor Vaughn, who, of course, was the pastor at Engrafted Word. Well, it was CCF at that time, Cookwell Christian Fellowship. He's one that founded that church. So that was my pastor's pastor as he was coming into the things of God or kind of rededicating his life, serving, going to college there at Tennessee Tech. But Pastor Vaughn had Pastor Bill McCray and Rama Bible Training Center. So that shows that even my pastor's pastor at that time, before he passed away, even had a pastor and had training. So Pastor Darren, who is uh, one of uh, Pastor Chris's pastors that he had and is still uh, close with, I've actually got to meet him and be in services with him, got to know him. So Pastor Darren also had Pastor Bill McCray, Rama, Christ for the Nations Institute, and Dr. Barclay. Pastor Trey, another one of my pastor's pastors, had Pastor Darren and Dr. Barclay. Reverend Lucy Sheets had Dr. Lester Summerall. Pastor Quokel had Brother Cole. Dr. Barclay had Pastor Billy Fallings, Pastor John Osteen, Dr. Lester Summerall, Dr. Roy Hicks, Dr. George Evans, and Dr. Hilton Sutton. All of these ministers have or had a reputation for being submitted and teachable. The only ones that failed are those that left their disciple or mentor or pastor. 
They're the ones that have failed. So next is heart and vision. When a Christian has been discipled, part of their mentor's heart is transferred and their vision is caught. Now, a vision has to be caught. It can't be taught. Even the Word tells us that we write it down, not to be learned, but to be caught, that you can, he that may see it may run with it. Well, how can you, you can't run, you know, holding it. You're going to catch it. You're going to memorize it. You're going to catch the heart of it and the vision for it and run and go do. So discipleship does not just communicate knowledge. It transfers heart. Catching a mentor's heart is typically much more critical than learning their knowledge. Amen. That's why I know, being sent out as a pastor here, I know what our mission is, and that's to help change this region. Well, how do you know that? Well, first of all, God told me. But second of all, that's my pastor's heart. So, and, and we are part of that mission. Part of that vision is to help change this region. So if, if that's... Not only what my pastor's taught me, but what God has put in, in my spirit, man, in my heart, that I know our, that's not only from my pastor, that's from God. So we've got to do our part to, to help change this region. So Philippians 2, 19 through 22 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to, to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father he hath served with me in the gospel. So Paul had numerous disciples, Titus, Erastus, Apollos, John Mark, Silas, Tychicus, Aphroditus, or Epaphroditus, excuse me, Aquila and Priscilla. But according to Paul's own confession, no one was as close or as trustworthy as Timothy. That's Paul's own words. Not what everybody else says. It's Paul's own words. So Timothy had caught Paul's mind. They, they were equal in soul, we could say. So Timothy's mind, will, and emotions had come up to the level of Paul's. So he was now a carbon copy of Paul. Consequently, Paul promoted and used Timothy more than any of his other disciples. Have you caught your disciples' heart? Is their influence upon you evident? So we can see that as Paul even wrote two books, or two epistles we would say, to Timothy, he was helping him to to push him in the things of the faith, encourage him, helping motivate him and do things because he knows, all right, if, if this man, this is, one of my, this is one of my best disciples, we could say, if he's needing encouragement and I can't be there, I'm going to send him help because he knows this man is submitted to me, this man is in need of help, and so I'm going to get him the help that he needs one way or the other, whether I can go see him or whether I'm going to write to him, but he's submitted to me, he's been faithful to me, so I'm going to be faithful to him. And you've got to be careful that when, especially when leaders begin to turn and not have, we would say, maybe time or other things for different people. If it's us, we've got to wonder, all right, where have I turned away from my spiritual leaders? Because if, you've, if leaders have been taught accurately, you invest in those that are willing to receive. And you don't give as much investment for those that don't want it. Now, somebody may have the right heart and say, you know, well, I don't want, I don't want to bog you down. I don't want to take a lot of your time. But that's, a, that's still a good heart that you can sow into. Not so much that it's a time issue. It's a good heart. That when you are around, you can sow into. But the difference is, is when somebody says, well, I need your help with this. And then you give them advice. You give them the word. And then they don't do it. Well, we just wasted 45 minutes. I gave you the word. I gave you all this. And now you're not going to do anything with it. After a few times of that, that leader is going to start drying up their time. Because they say, why am I going to waste breath? Why am I going to waste time? I could be doing something else. Right. Amen. I could be doing something else in my life that's going to benefit me. And not just a waste of air and a waste of time. Amen. So if... 
Paul knows this is the heart of Timothy of, of, to be truly submitted and receive what he has for him, then he's going to make himself faithful to him. And that's exactly what good leaders do, good disciple makers, is, is those that will receive it, those that will do it, they invest in them. They take, they take their time. You know, they take time and effort and, and put that into them. Amen. But again, have you caught your disciples' heart? Is there influence upon you evidence? What my mentors have taught me. Again, this is my pastor's testimony. He says, I'm no longer just Chris McMichael, which that almost pains me to say just even to read it because I'm, I, my heart says Pastor Chris McMichael. But we've got to read it as it is to understand what my pastor's saying. God has permitted me to become an algamation. Alm, yeah. <laughs> of all, I forgot where it was. Of all my of all my father's pastors and heroes, so he's no longer just himself. He's the com- combining of all of these voices and influence and fathers and mentors of who has helped make him who he is, and that's the way we should all be. You know, part of part of me pastoring and preaching is not just all my pastor, not just all Dr. Barkley. There's still little things in me that I can remember my dad doing or saying, little different little quirks that he would say and do. And that I remember those. And when I say it and it comes out, I'm like, yeah, that, that was definitely one of my dad moments. I can definitely understand that. But, you know, of course, you know, being, uh, of course, Miss Tiffany and I have been married, you know, 19 years this year. So it's been a little while since we've been, at, you know, his church and things of that nature. So I do have more of a flavor of Pastor Chris and Dr. Barkley, things of that nature. But because I'm still that combining of all of those influences, there's still things that come out because that's part of who I am. Not just because it was my dad, because that was my pastor growing up. Because I heard him preach all the time. Amen. That's important. So there are times when I minister, when I feel just like Dr. Barclay or Pastor Vaughn. A few times I felt like Dr. Lester Summerall. And I'm happy to have followed them as they follow the Lord. Amen. Yeah. I can definitely tell, especially being a pastor, when because it requires me to preach more, to minister more, I can definitely see and, and feel those things come out of me where I, I said that. I said that like Pastor Chris, right? Yeah, I said that like Dr. Barclay. And especially in SMTI seasons when I minister, I can definitely feel a lot of Dr. Barclay come out. Amen. Because why? Because I'm submitting to him three hours each week and hearing those videos and receiving the word from him, but also receiving my pastor because I'm around him as well too. Last point here on this says, my heart and vision for the gospel ministry have been shaped by all of my influencers. I no longer have my own vision. I no longer have a a dream of any kind. Amen. Of course, you, you all know my testimony. My original dream was to go play music and to be a big somebody and at least put one Christian song on every CD. God's like, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, you know, of course, being around my pastor, you know, and, and, and having, that, having the word washed over me, having his influence washed over me, I realized, Lord, I just submit to you. I don't have any dreams. I'm just going to submit to you because I could come up with a plan. I could come up with my own thing and then have you flush it all down the drain, drain just to laugh at me and say, this is what I need you to do. Yes, sir. Because if I say anything but yes, sir, then that shows my heart's not aligned with God. I'm not truly submitted. Amen. Now, I'm going to take a pastoral moment. If God's leading us to do something as a church, and I asked disciples or people of the church to do something, we're not a cult just because you obey what I say or what I ask you to do that shows that your heart is towards God and towards this church and towards me as your pastor to fulfill what we need to get done as a ministry. Amen. Amen. Next is personality change. One purpose of discipleship is to make you something you have not been able to accomplish on your own. Praise God. I can tell you, hands down, I would not be able to be who I am today without my pastor. I would still be the backwards, kind of shy WB frog, unless I got behind the pulpit. Because my pastor has put a boldness and a courage and confidence in me, even outside the pulpit, 
Now, granted, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty bold behind the pulpit because that's the anointing of God, but to be outside of that, there's more compassion, there's more grace, but I'm not afraid to speak to people. Well, you were in the military. Yes, that, that also helped, but being around my pastor, watching him interact, and not afraid to stand for the things of God helped me more than anything. Amen. So this will inevitably bring about some sort of soul change because the aim of discipleship is to renew your mind, will, and emotions. Being a real disciple would change your personality. So it's the discipleship is to help renew our mind, our will, and our emotions into what? Into the things of God, into what we're supposed to look like as Christians. But being a real disciple, not a fake one, not an imitation, the genuine article. Amen. And a real disciple will change your personality. Those that knew you pre-discipleship will undoubtedly be able to say, wow, you're different. You've changed. What happened to you? And that's your open door to say, let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you about my church. Let me tell you about what God's done for me, how he's changed me, how the word of God has helped me, how my pastor has helped me, how this has helped me, how that's helped me. Amen. This is a wonderful mark of discipleship we should embrace without fear. We all need to change somewhere in our personality. Never fight to stay the same. Fight to change. Now, I'm going to read that again because this region needs to hear that. We all need to change somewhere in our personality. We all do. We all do. We'll never reach perfection now, I don't, by that, I don't mean the maturity. I mean perfection, like we got it all figured out and we're perfect. We will never reach that until we reach glory, until we reach heaven. We should never fight to stay the same. When God's telling us to change, when God's using the word of God to change us to more like Christ, then we should never fight to stay the same. We should say, all right, Lord, I'll change. If you want me to change, I'll change. Now, for anybody that's wanting to feel super spiritual, you... you you, you fight to stay the same on the things of God as I'm not going pagan, I'm not going rogue, I'm not going against the word of God. So you fight to stay the same in that regard. But even then, you're fighting to press forward, not be the same. So we fight to change. We fight to go even from where we're at in the things of God to fight forward, to go push forward because we're not of those who draw back. That's a bad change. We don't want to do that either. We've got to push forward. And I would dare say, if you're not pushing forward in the things of God, you're actually going backwards. Because especially as much as the world is pushing and, and trying to pull people away, if you're not moving forward, you say, well, I'll just stay still. No, there's no such thing anymore. Man, fight to change. Don't fight to stay the same. So Acts 4.13, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. That is one of my favorite verses. Because, you know, the King James says unlearned and ignorant. It means they were unlearned, they were uneducated. But they can tell they've been with Jesus. They've been with that man from Nazareth. Amen. The rulers, elders, and scribes could tell that Peter and John had been discipled by Jesus because of their confidence, despite their lack of education and formal training. Jesus had training. He was in, he was in the synagogues. He was a teacher. He was a rabbi. But so he had that kind of confidence. But it not, not only came from this training, it more so came from God. That's like you can tell who walks with God. You know, by the anointing, when they had that boldness, that confidence, not an arrogance or pride, but they had that boldness and confidence to say, this is what the word of God says. I'm not backing down off of it. This is what my God has told me to say, so this is where I'm standing. Whereas somebody that's been educated, they can get up, have the elaborate speech, make it all sound good, but there's no authority, no power in it. Because there's the spirit of fear, we would, as we recently discussed, there's the spirit of religion. But God doesn't give us that. He gives us a power, love, and a sound mind or sound doctrine. Amen. So their changed personality amazed them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Discipleship changes personalities. Amen. And I will say this. 
If you're being discipled, you should truly submit to your disciple maker, that's your spiritual leader, because if you don't, you will not have a split personality. You won't be you know, able to split that personality of when you're around your pagan friends, you got to be pagan, and when you're around the house of God, you'll be around the, you'll act like the house of God. That's a split personality. Whoever is discipling you more is who you're going to walk like, talk like, and act like. Either good or bad. Either you'll be in the things in, in the natural world or natural jobs or whatever the case may be, and you'll talk like a Christian because that's discipling you. Or you'll be in the house of God trying to speak your Christianese, as we recently said, which is the bridge that tries to make, they try to make between a sinful world, sinful carnal world, and a Christian world. But really, when it comes out, it's going to come out as more pagan and Christianese fake than it is the things of God. So you, you can't have that split personality. You can't be too sold because we've got to make up our mind who we're going to serve, who we're going to let disciple us. Because one of them's going to win. Amen. Whichever one you feed, whichever one you're discipled by, is the one that's going to speak the loudest in your life and who you'll take on. Discipleship changes personalities. Are you still the same in your soul? Is there any evidence of emotional growth? Have you found the courage and confidence? That only walking with Jesus Christ can achieve. So what my mentors have taught me. Boldness. Pastor Vaughn was never afraid to confront sin in anybody's life. At any place. At any time. Amen. So I guess we could say that that boldness comes through. Well, also comes from Dr. Barclay. But both of those come through my pastor, which comes down to me. So y'all don't have a choice. Amen. <laughs> Fearlessness. Pastor Cuoco once said, if you spend one week with me, you will never fear anything again. He feared nothing from anyone on any continent. Amen. Compassion and patience. Dr. Barclay is a master of mercy and long-suffering when it comes to cutting people off due to sin. He strives to maintain relationships many would avoid in hopes that he might help the wayward again one day. Amen. Let's see if we can... If I can finish this in record time here. Servitude. Another evidence of true biblical discipleship is a manifestation of heartfelt servitude. The sin nature does not naturally long to serve anyone but self. That is very evident in today's time. Let that not be us. May we say we're serving God. We're going to serve our fellow man because we honor God. And he tells us, he tells us in his word to love him, to serve him. To love our fellow man, to honor them. And part of the way we honor them is to serve them. Even if it's just through prayer because they don't deserve any other honor. We honor them through prayer. We serve them through prayer. Servitude is a fruit of discipleship. Every epistle author opened their letters declaring themselves to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Or a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke twenty two twenty six 26 says, Be ye, but ye, excuse me, shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he doth serve. He that doth serve. Serving is the only way to become great in the kingdom. Greatness is not found in age or in lordship. It is only found in humility and laying down your life. It is not natural to the sinful ego. It must be discipled into the believer. Galatians 5.13 for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Once again, the, selfish, the selfishness of man would desire to take its newfound liberty and indulge itself rather than use it to serve. Discipleship trains a Christian to take their liberty and convert it into Christian service. True discipleship will take that liberty and converted into Christian service. That does not mean that people go and they hand out water bottles. They go and help people in time of need. And they take the, the, you know, all the selfies of what they're doing. Post it on social media. And then go about their business. That is not true servitude. That is self-indulgence. And that's self-serving. Because it's saying look at me. Look what I've done. 
Because probably five minutes later after they take their pictures, they're all done. <laughs> Just to put that out there. But true discipleship trains a Christian to take that liberty and convert it into service. So what my mentors have taught me, Pastor Vaughn said, I don't have to make sacrifices to God. I get to make sacrifices for him. Amen. We don't have to. We get to. Praise God. It's an attitude. It could be the same work. It's just all an attitude. Pastor Okwokwo, brother, you must learn to pray until things change. This takes a lot of sacrifice of personal time and pleasure. Amen. Dr. Barclay, I'm always going to be talking to somebody about ministry. This thing of service never shuts off. Being a servant is a 24-7 endeavor, not a weekend outreach sign-up. Do you show any evidence of discipleship in your life? What is lacking? What will you do about it? So we can see that discipleship is very important, but not only that, the evidence of having discipleship in our life should it will show us where we stand and if we're truly submitted to discipleship and who we're submitted to in discipleship. Amen. So I, I encourage you to go back over these lessons. I know we kind of broke the first two up into uh, many different parts, but you can go back and review all these because this is our theme for this year. So I encourage you to, you know, maybe uh, you can wait a little bit of a time, but throughout this year, just kind of go back and, and listen to a few of these at a time. Amen. Just to kind of keep our heart in line with discipleship and what it really is. Amen.